Okay. All right. So I'd like to actually give you just a little bit of review on the, the resonance we talked about the last time, because some of you apparently are struggling with the homework problem. So just to recap what we have done. So we have this second order perturbation theory to compute the cross section. But in case when you send in a photon, that correspond to just exactly the energy difference between 1s and 2p state, it seems that cross-section diverges, but I told you that it doesn't because the 2p state actually acquires this complex or imaginary part of the energy of the state. And the way you can compute this imaginary part of the state is using, again, this result from second order perturbation theory on the energy shift. And because of this i epsilon, if you actually remember the, uh, uh, the identity in the contour integral actually gives you precisely the imaginary part you need for this purpose. And just by using this identity in contour integral, you can derive that the imaginary part of the energy of the 2p state turns out to be exactly the same thing as the decay rate of the 2p state times h bar over two. So you're supposed to put that in there. And that actually turns out to be exactly the same thing as you would expect from the exponential decay law by identifying that tau is inverse of W and therefore H bar over gamma, where gamma is the width of this, what we now call the resonance. And so the any state that actually decays end up having this a slightly blurred energy level, which is given by this width gamma. So width is again, H bar over lifetime of that state. And so this is the width that actually goes into this formula for the cross section and so that the cross section actually remains finite, even when you hit exactly the, uh, uh, the energy difference between 1s and 2p state in the photon you actually send in. So that's what we talked about the last time. I didn't show you the examples of this. So this is how it looks like actually. So if you look at the photon hydrogen atom scattering, and this is not data, I couldn't find the real data on this unfortunately, but this is a very precise calculations I found from relatively recent paper uh, in 2016. Then what you see here is this incredible peaks. And these peaks of course correspond to the precise energies of the energy differences among energy levels uh, for the energy of the photon you send in. But you can see that this is actually slightly broadened and then have a tail. So this is how the cross section behaves. And next slide shows a little bit more blow up of these low energy regions. So that you can now appreciate that each peak has a width. So this is the width I was talking about. And of course, these width are very narrow in the case of atomic transitions, because as you saw in the calculations, energy levels go like alpha squared, while the lifetime goes like alpha cube, uh, alpha fifth. So there is basically a six orders of magnitude of a suppression relative to the location of the energy levels. So they are incredibly narrow, but nonetheless, if you do this kind of, kind of precise calculation, you can see that you have actually put that in. If you go to other areas of physics like nuclear physics, you find that the uh, lifetimes are much shorter and uh, with a uh, uh, wider. So this is actually the cross section of sending in a neutron on top of the uranium-238 and the neutron gets captured. But when the neutron gets captured to become uranium-239, it, it doesn't become the ground state right away. So after the capture, it has to emit photon, in this case, of course, gamma ray photons because it's much higher energy uh, physics and, and gamma ray photon emission would bring the 239 uranium excited state down to the ground state. In some cases, not all, all at once, but in multiple emission of the gamma rays. So the point here is that if you measure the uh, cross section as a function of the energy of the incident neutron for this process, that neutron gets captured and then de-excite to the ground state of 239, you have we find many, 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 many peaks like this. But you do see, at least in this case, that the peak does have a width. And that width corresponds to the finite lifetime of these excited states you're looking at. And in the case of uranium-238, this process of the uranium, uh, the neutron capture is a dominant process, but there's a subdominant process where after capturing a neutron, the nucleus breaks up into the fission fragments. And as you all know, 
that if you would like to build a nuclear power plant, the uranium-238 tends to actually stop the nuclear fusion, uh, the uh, fission process, because it ends up capturing neutrons. So fission uh, probability is actually low. But if you go to uranium-235 instead, then fission cross-section in red, uh, it tends to be actually even bigger than this capture cross-section. So that's how you keep multiplying the, uh, the, the neutrons from as a fission fragments, and then can cause a chain reaction that each fission process when the uranium-235 fragments into uh, different uh, smaller parts, and that would also emit a couple of neutrons on its way. And that neutron would further cause this fission process and, and keeps multiplying. So that's the way you arrange a chain reaction and, and you would like to control it in the case of uh, uh, nuclear power plants to make sure that it doesn't explode for obvious reasons. And that's exactly what actually uh, atomic weapons do. So the point here is that these processes you see actually are given by this excited states of the uranium-236 nucleus, and then you see the peaks, and, and that's where the cross-section is large. But at the same time, if you actually go back to very low energy, the neutron, what you see here is a cross-section is even approaching beyond 10,000 barn. And you may not be familiar with this unit, barn. Barn corresponds to 10 to the minus 24 square centimeters. So that's roughly the size of the atomic nucleus. So uranium nucleus has a size of about one barn, slightly smaller than that. But the cross-section for this process is actually more than four orders of magnitude bigger than this. So the neutron capture cross-section by uranium-235 is incredibly big, much, much bigger than the physical size of the nucleus itself. That's why this nuclide can actually efficiently cause the neutron capture in this fission process and therefore chain reaction. And so uh, this is something I'm sure you have heard about from uh, uh, the freshman physics classes, but now you see the idea. So the cross-section is the way you can determine the rate of reaction per unit, per unit flux. And that cross-section has these uh, peaks, which correspond to the excited states. But because the excited states have finite lifetime, they appear as resonances in these cross-sections with a finite width. And that's what you're seeing in the case of uranium-238 and uranium-235. And a final example is actually an excited state of proton. So if you send in even higher energy gamma ray uh, incident on proton, then proton would absorb a photon and turn into actually an excited state. Proton has an excited state. In this case, it's called a delta resonance or delta plus specifically just because of the electric charge is plus one. And this excited state also has a finite time, lifetime decaying dominantly into something called the pion and the proton or charged pion and neutron. It can of course go back to the photon and proton as well. Then it's an elastic scattering. If the final state is different from the initial state, you're talking about inelastic scattering. But in any case, this is a plot that shows the total cross section of this photon on proton. And again, you see a peak here. And this peak has a finite width, which corresponds to the lifetime of the excited state of the proton decaying back into the, uh, you know, the initial state of gamma P or the states of the pion and, and proton and neutron. So this width here indicates the inverse lifetime of this excited state of the proton called the delta resonance. So here are the examples I've shown you today. So uh, I've shown you first examples of the atomic transitions and then nuclear transitions and uh, elementary particle transitions. And in all cases, you see the uh, excited states appearing as a peak in the cross section and the peak has a finite width which corresponds to the inverse lifetime of these excited states. Okay, so let me let me stop this discussion here. Any questions about these examples? <clears throat> um, what exactly uh, was the difference between the two uranium processes uh, for 235? One with a photon as your uh, like remaining uh, products, but you also have fission fragments. I guess, what was the difference between uh, the green yeah, and the so, red? 
so initial state is the same. You are sending a neutron on the uranium nucleus. A neutron gets captured, but then this captured uh, uranium state now either go into the ground state or some other excited states uranium by emitting a photon. So that's sort of similar to atomic transitions that excited state would settle down to low energy states by emitting a photon. It's not UV or optical. In this case, of course, it's a gamma ray, but anyway, so that's the only difference. So, so similar idea. But this uranium nucleus is actually pretty unstable and can actually sort of uh, 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 fragments into, let's say, two nuclei with a couple of neutrons. And that's the nuclear fission process. So you can measure the rate of two final states, uh, the rates into the two final states independently. So what you're doing is the same thing. You're sending a neutron in. But if you do find a photon in the final state, you count that as a part of the cross-section in green. If you find nuclear fragments together with a couple of neutrons in the final state, you count them towards the red line. So these are the two different curves here. Does that answer your question, Sahil? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah OK. Any other questions? OK, so these are meant to be just examples of the idea already explained to you on Wednesday and, and just reinforce this idea that this is a very generic phenomenon. So the peaks in cross-section uh, correspond to excited states as you expect, but because excited states correspond uh, actually have finite lifetime, they appear as the peaks with a finite width where width is given by H bar over lifetime of that excited state. So that's the general idea. Okay. So then uh, let us move into the discussion on the Lorentz invariant quantum field theories, which we started already. And I reviewed the convention uh, we are going to use uh, for special relativity. So we introduced the upper index and lower index. An upper index has spatial entries given by just a spatial vector of, of the quantity. In this case, this is space time coordinate. So X, Y, Z are the spatial coordinates. Uh, compared to CT, that's the time coordinate times C to make sure that they have the same dimensions. But when you go to lower index, you have to uh, the reverse the signs of the spatial components and to make sure that the contraction between upper and lower indices gives you Lorentz invariant. So for this purpose, we also introduced the idea called the metric tensor. So if you sandwich metric tensor by two vectors of the same type, that's the same thing as contracting the vector with one lower index and one upper index. So either way, you build up invariance, which is always given in this form. So that the inner product of the two Lorentz four vectors is given by the contraction between one lower index and one upper index. And because the lower index is inverting the signs of spatial components from an upper index, that gives you this minus sign for the inner product of spatial components. And that's in the end is the same thing as using this metric tensor to uh, define the inner products of vectors. So that is the notation. And we use that also for the momentum vector. And we looked at this familiar expression for the energy uh, in relativistic particles. We also looked at this wave factor, which is given also by this Lorentz invariant inner product between energy momentum four vector and space time four vector. And we also define the derivatives. So if you find the partial derivatives with respect to the space-time coordinates x mu, then that defines the derivative operator where index is actually a lower index. So because upper index is downstairs, basically, the end result is an index lower index. And using this derivative operator, you can actually start getting the uh, p mu out of this plane wave factor by acting derivative on top of it. So using derivative with the lower index, uh, you extract the momentum with a lower index. And if you do it twice and contract over mu indices, then you basically get the Lorentz uh, invariant p squared, which is nothing but m squared c squared. So this is the place where we, we can actually start guessing what kind of wave equation we want uh, to a, a, in a Lorentz invariant theory. So that's the review we have done.
And then this is the piece that actually, I, I think responds to Sakhil's question uh, verbally on Wednesday, but I actually wrote this out explicitly here. So what is the possible Lorentz transformation is given by this requirement that this Lorentz invariant inner product remains unchanged before and after the Lorentz transformation. So I already mentioned that this Lorentz invariant inner product is given by A, metric tensor and B, so that you multiply time components together and then use this minus sign of the metric tensor and subtract the inner product of spatial components. So that was a definition I, ga I gave just a, a minute ago. So the question is, if you do Lorentz transformation, that B goes to L, so matrix B, A goes to L, A, transposed G, and this thing after the Lorentz transformation has to be the same as the thing before the Lorentz transformation. So by writing this out as A transpose, L transpose, G, L, B, I need to make sure that the three things in the middle, namely L transpose, G, L, has to be the same as G before the transformation. So that's the requirement. And that's the requirement I actually wrote down uh, last time. And uh, the Ryan pointed out that I forgot minus signs for these components downstairs. So I actually added them in now. So this is the requirement. So we verify that this kind of boost, Lorentz boost along the X direction is an example of Lorentz transformation. And, and in, in order for this to remain the same metric transfer after the Lorentz transformation, we now have found that beta, which is V minus C for the relative velocity between reference frames is related to this factor gamma as one of a square root of one minus beta squared. So as long as beta and gamma are by the, given the same V, then this qualifies as the Lorentz transformation. So the, you can actually completely classify what are the possible transformations which satisfy this requirement. And they are always given by the product of three spatial rotations. Obviously, spatial rotation is part of the Lorentz invariance and three Lorentz boost along X direction, Y direction or Z direction. So these six transformations together will give you a general Lorentz transformation that satisfies this requirement. So that's what was the end of the discussion on Wednesday. Okay, let me pause here again to see if there are any questions about this, uh, uh, the review of the discussions on relativity. Um, is the transpose exactly analogous to the um, lower index? Uh, no, the, the, the idea is that this transpose times G is the same as the lower index because okay. you have to change the sign, right? Mm -hmm. So taking transpose, doesn't change the sign of the spatial components. Only after multiplying with G, you change the signs of the spatial components. So multiplying G is what corresponds to the switch from upper index to lower index. So the idea is that if you have this G mu nu matrix, which is one minus one minus one minus one, and if you multiply this matrix on X nu, then you flip the signs of X, Y, and Z because of these minus ones. And that is the same thing as lowering the upper index, contract it with the lower index. And what remains is another lower index. So that's the way you get X with the lower index. Does that make sense? Yeah. So as long as you keep track of what index is lower, what index is upper, then there's no way of making mistakes. You just always make sure that you can only contract one upper index and one lower index, then, then you wouldn't make any mistakes on the way. Okay, any further questions? Uh, yes, I think okay, you made it in, in this slide. Uh, this the slide, last okay. second. Yeah, the, the h bar uh, partial mu e to the minus i p dot x. Ah, there's a minus right. i here. That's right, I, yeah. No, no, you can have minus I, one. Uh, hmm? No, I mean, there should be an I in front of H bar. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's the same a, thing. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. Thank you. So I need to put I here and I put minus sign here. Thank you. I'm going to correct that too. <laughs>
Good. Any further questions or comments, complaints, criticisms? All right. <laughs> so let me move on. So the first thing to, to do is to look back at Maxwell's equations we talked about. And, and you know this already, I believe, uh, from some other classes in electromagnetism. But now that we have this electric and magnetic field, which is written in terms of the scalar and vector potential, we put them together as a electromagnetic four vector. So scalar potential over C has the same dimension as the vector potential. You can put them together into a four vector so that the, what we call scalar potential is actually the time component of the four vector potential. And correspondingly, we can also put the charge density rho and current density J into a current four vector. So charge density times C has the same dimension as the current density because the current density has clearly the dimension of charge density times velocity. So then you can put them together into a four vector. And once you know that they form a four vector together, you can also, you also learn immediately how you can go from one reference frame to another. For example, if we have a static, the charge density uh, in one reference frame, then you have rho times C, but zero current density. But doing a Lorentz boost, we talked about on a, 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 to a few slides ago, then you can go from that reference frame to a new reference frame where the charge is now moving. Then what do you do is you start with rho C zero in the initial reference frame, perform the Lorentz transformation. Then you know that the charge density, the new reference frame is gamma rho C, which is bigger than original charge density because the same amount of charge is in the same volume, which is now squeezed by Lorentz contraction. So the charge density actually increases by the Lorentz contraction. So that's why this turns into gamma rho C. And then the charge density, the current density from the Lorentz transformation we talked about is gamma beta times rho C. And that of course makes sense because now a gamma, gamma beta times rho C has beta times C, beta times C is V for the relative velocity between two reference frames. So then this J turns out to be indeed charge density, which includes the fact of gamma from Lorentz contraction times V, which is the velocity of the, uh, the charge fluid that's moving in the new reference frame. So this is just not a matter of convenience to put them together into a single four vector. Once they are together in a single four vector, you have now very useful uh, 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 information, namely that you can go from whatever reference frame you are in to whatever new reference frame you'd like to be. And you know exactly how these objects will transform from one reference frame to another. So there's a very important thing that you know this combination is a Lorentz four vector. And once you put them together into Lorentz four vector, then the field strength tensor F mu nu is given by this curl of A, but this is not the three dimensional curl like magnetic field, but now a four dimensional curl, both for space and time components. Then using this, the uh, field strength, you can identify that electric field is given by space time component of this F mu nu tensor. And you can see that mu and nu indices are anti-symmetric here. So there is no zero zero component that identically vanishes. So F tensor mu nu is an anti-symmetric tensor with six components because you have to choose a two out of four and then changing the order of mu and nu is a double counting. So that's how you end up with six components. So Three of the components have one spatial index, one and one time index, and they precisely correspond to the electric field. On the other hand, when you have uh, uh, two spatial components, like two, three, and if you work it out, then you have to be careful about the fact that the derivative with the upper spatial index is actually a derivative with a lower index with the negative sign, 
So you have to pay, keep paying attention to the sign issues. Then you find that this combination is the curl of the vector potential in spatial directions. So this indeed gives you the magnetic field. So this, this thing about the sign is something you have to get used to. Whenever you go from upper and lower index, you need to be sure to put in minus signs for the spatial components. You also need to remember that the upper spatial components are the same thing as normal vectors. But for derivatives, the lower spatial components are the usual derivatives. So that's what I showed you in a couple of uh, pre uh, previous results uh, slides over here. So derivative with the upper index gives you the derivative operator with the lower index. So you have to keep track of that fact. And that's why when you actually write this operator here, the spatial component i is upstairs in this derivative, which is the usual partial derivative with minus sign here. And otherwise you don't get the correct definition of the electric field. And also similarly for the F23, unless you remember this final, uh, the minus sign, you get the wrong sign for the magnetic field. And so you have to be careful about it. And once actually you define this uh, field strength tensor F mu nu, then first and last Maxwell equation is given by this now Lorentz covariant form. And now you see that this is just one equation for the entire F mu nu, so that divergence of F mu nu, this is the four dimensional divergence, is given by this current four vector. On the other hand, the other two middle Maxwell equations are identically zero from the property that two partial derivatives commute. So if you write this F rho sigma using this derivative curl form, and together with the epsilon tensor, I have two partial derivatives with two anti-symmetric indices, nu and rho, and because the derivatives commute, their anti-symmetric combination identically vanishes. So that's how you obtain the middle two equations among the Maxwell equations. So the minute you write F mu nu in terms of this four dimensional curl, then two middle equations are trivially satisfied called Bianchi identity. And first and last equations are the only non-trivial equations you are supposed to solve. And those equations are now put together in this compact form of the four divergences of F mu nu given by the four current. So that's the idea of how to use this relativistic notation to simplify things. Okay, uh, you probably have seen this elsewhere, but any questions about this? Um, so I had a question about the four vectors. So okay. like we kind of think of the current four vector in terms of like, uh, we can justify in terms of like length contraction, right? Uh, as we like transform frames, but is there like a similar way to kind of justify the form of the potential four vector? Uh, that's actually uh, uh, not a uh, uh, um, good idea. It's, it's not easy to do because uh, as you know, the, uh, the um, the vector potential or four vector potential by itself doesn't have a physical meaning because they are gauge uh, not invariant. They, they change by gauge transformations. They only the field strength uh, have a uh, direct physical meaning. So the defining Lorentz contraction of A mu by itself is actually not a good thing to look at. But as we talked about in the case of the Schrodinger field, when we discuss superconductivity, you can make sure to put this A mu together with the derivatives to define again, covariant derivative. And covariant derivative as a whole still has this uh, the Lorentz index mu. Then you can actually start contracting that index. So A by itself is not a very useful thing, but together with the derivative operator, that becomes the covariant derivative. And covariant derivative being covariant, you can actually start contracting that index with the other Lorentz indices to define Lorentz invariants, then it makes sense. Is that the question you were asking? Yeah, I think so. So I just, just to clarify, like by itself, does, uh, does the, a, uh, the, the A4 vector satisfy like Lorentz invariants 
under uh, like under uh, boost in uh, rotation. Uh, the A itself does satisfy the proper Lorentz transformation. So they are covariant under Lorentz transformation. So in the same way that any four vector transforms, that's what we talked about here, the A vector transforms the same way. So if that's the question, then A vector does make sense and transforms in the same way as any other Lorentz vectors do. So the only caveat I have given you is that, so as far as the Lorentz transformation goes, A is already just fine. You can transform in any way uh, from one Lorentz point to another, but A itself doesn't have a direct physical meaning because it's actually changes on the gauge transformation. So you already have to put this into this, uh, the, uh, 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 the field strength or put that as a part of the covariant derivative. Is that okay? Yeah, thanks. Okay. And so this is what I was going to say here. So we talked about gauge transformation when we talked about the electromagnetism before. And now that we actually have this four vector notation of the field strength, we can also try to make sure that gauge invariance is manifestly Lorentz covariant. So what we discussed before is a scalar potential changes to new scalar potential by a time derivative of some arbitrary function chi. And the vector potential also changes by the same function chi with the gradient, but there is an opposite sign here too. So it turns out that uh, the way you do the gauge transformation is with this uh, relativistic notation is just the, the four derivative of this function chi. And now you remember that derivative operator with upper index for the time component is the same thing as derivative operator uh, down up to the lower component. And derivative operator by the, the time component is one over C times T derivative. On the other hand, the time component of A is phi over C. So both A and del mu chi have one over C common factor in there. So I can cancel them to find, to recover this gauge transformation we looked at before. But when you actually look at the spatial components, the upper index for A is the vector potential itself. But this derivative with the upper component is the normal derivative with the opposite sign. So this minus sign turns into the positive sign. So that's how you recover the gauge transformation we looked at before with this correct relative sign between the two expressions. So this single expression contains both of them together. And that's why this relativistic notation is handy and, and easy to deal with. And using this notation, it's also directly obvious that the field strength does not change because this is basically the gradient. This is the curl of that. So again, because two derivatives commute, then this piece chi completely drops out from the definition of the field strength. So this is the way you can talk about gauge invariance. And then of course we know that the, the, uh, all the equations of motion depend only on the field strength. So this is now the way to verify that uh, uh, the Maxwell equations are indeed gauge invariant, but now in fully relativistic notation. Okay, again, let me stop here to see if there are any questions about this gauge transformation. I just had a quick question on the upper index derivative. So mm -hmm. if derivatives only like make sense with the lower index, at least that's how they're defined, then uh, I guess what's the significance of introducing this upper index derivative? Because when you would like to write down this f mu nu, and I put both mu and nu upstairs, I need to make sure that, that the, what is upstairs, what is downstairs is consistent throughout. So then this mu has to be upstairs too. So then I need to use this derivative with upstairs index. And if I go back, then that's different from this lower index which is defined by these usual derivatives. So to bring this upstairs, I need to put minus signs for the spatial components. 
Am I answering your question? Um, yeah. So if, if you take the upper index of the derivative, you just negate uh, the spatial components, or do you also um, take the indices to the upper as well? Oh, uh, well, so this, this is the usual x derivative. So, uh, mm -hmm. so here, uh, what I mean is just the purely derivative with respect to the x uh, coordinate. So, oh, okay, I see. yeah, so I don't, I don't bring x upstairs. So this is the usual derivative with uh, respect to x. Maybe this was okay. abuse of notation. So uh, I'm sorry about that. Okay, yeah, I guess that's what I was just confused about. Okay, yeah, good. Thank you for asking. Any other questions? So again, this upper and lower index thing is, is something that gets used, uh, 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 you need to get used to. And, and you know, initially you might make mistakes, but uh, the, the, the thing you need to be careful about is just to make sure that you keep track of what's upstairs, what's downstairs. For example, in this case, this is how you write this first and last equations among Maxwell's equations in the relativistic notation. And mu is contracted between upper and lower index. And that's the only contraction that you are allowed to do. And then you have one leftover upper index. And correspondingly, the right-hand side of the equation also has one leftover upper index. You can never mix up upper index here and lower index there, for instance. Then you, you find something inconsistent because the two sides of the equation would not transform the same way under the Lorentz transformation. So you are not allowed to do that. So if you contract indices, always you contract one lower index and one upper index. So that's how you can sort of remove mu from the left-hand side now that they are contracted, but you're still left with one upper index and you also have one upper index over here. So that's the way you make sure that everything is consistent. If you look at this equation, which is the middle two equations among master's equations, I have new derivative with an upper index because I wanted to actually contract the indices with this epsilon tensor with a lower index. So this new lower index is contracted with this new upper index. And similarly, lower row and upper row, lower sigma and upper sigma. And I have one leftover lower index mu. So if for some reason, if this quantity were non-zero, I should have had some vector on the right-hand side with one lower index. But in this case, by plugging in this, uh, uh, the definition of f mu nu, properly in there, then you find this actually identically vanishes. So that's why it's zero. But strictly speaking, this is actually four zeros because this is true for all four components of mu, which are not contracted. So in some sense, this is actually still in the form of the column vector so that this zero is like a zero, 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 and where four components correspond to this leftover lower index mu. So you have to keep track of these things. And then you quickly get used to this idea because you know just making sure that contraction is always between upper and lower is easy to remember. And you also make sure that the both sides of the equations always transform the same way. So I have one upper index here, I have one upper index here. So they are the same structure on both sides of the equation. So that's the way you make sure that you don't make any mistakes between lower and upper indices with this relativistic notation. Thanks for asking. Any further questions here? Is that okay? All right, so finally, uh, we would like to actually come to the field equation. Da, 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 da. Sorry, this is taking time. Okay, finally. So the idea is that when we actually wrote out the Lagrangian well, which we studied in the context of superconductivity, we had a Schrodinger field. We put together the vector potential and the spatial derivative into this form of the covariant derivative. We also put together the time derivative and the scalar potential in the form of, again, this is the covariant derivative. And you can actually start to guess that these covariant derivatives would generalize easily to a full Lorentz 
covariant derivative because this is actually the uh, derivative operator and this is actually the time component. So both of them are time components. Here again, this is the spatial component of the derivative. This is the spatial component of the vector potential. Here's one minus sign relative to the plus sign over here, which corresponds to the derivative operator with upstairs index now written as the ordinary spatial derivatives. So you can see that there is a sort of a, 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 a something you expect to become relativistic at the end of the day. But clearly the first line is not. The reason is that the second piece here is two powers of spatial derivatives. But the first ter term is only one power of the time derivative. So time and space are certainly not treated on equal footing. So even though there is a sign that covariant derivative seems to generalize well to a fully relativistic situation, this Lagrangian is not. And that's something we have to work on. On the other hand, this, uh, the, the, the Lagrangian for the uh, Maxwell field, E squared plus B squared, this can be written using F mu nu, it turns out that they nicely combine into the form. And once again, I have two upper indices mu and nu, and upper index mu is contracted with lower index mu. Upper index mu is contracted with lower index nu. So this contraction is guaranteed to give you Lorentz invariance. So this Lagrangian density is indeed Lorentz invariant. So this electromagnetism part is good but the matter part of Lagrangian is not good. It is still not Lorentz invariant. So that's the thing we would like to work on now. How do we fix the matter part of the Lagrangian to make sure that the full theory is Lorentz invariant? So that's the question we are going to ask on the next uh, 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 several slides. So any questions about this, where we are heading to? I don't know if anyone else can see it, but but there's like a little window that's blocking the part of the- Oh, there is? Yeah, okay, yeah. sorry. My spew too. What is that? Ah, okay, sorry about that. Is it, the... is it gone? Yeah, that's better, that's better now. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good, sorry about that. You know, you, you should be vocal about these things because I, it, it, I, I don't see that actually on my screen for some reason. But anyway, apart from that little box blocking the view, uh, are there any other questions about this? Is it clear where we are trying to go? Go. Okay. So matter part of Lagrangian is not Lorentz invariant, so we need to actually change it. So the first thing is to make some kind of educated guess, namely that is there a way of turning a non relativistic Schrodinger equation to a relativistic equation. So what we have done in the case of the non relativistic quantum mechanics is that you have the energy for the free particle, E is P squared over 2M. We replaced E by I H bar DT. We replaced P by H bar over I spatial derivative. And at this stage, it actually looks very much like something we can expect to generalize the relativity because this is after all time derivative. Energy is a time component of the energy momentum four vector. And in order to put them into energy momentum four vector, you need to put E over C. And that's the same thing as one over C times DDT is a derivative respect to the time component of the space time vector. And for momentum, I'm picking the spatial component of the four vector, but the spatial component of the four derivative vector is the opposite sign from the usual spatial derivatives. That's what we just talked about uh, several times a few minutes ago. So you are supposed to have minus sign relative to this one. And indeed, I goes from upstairs to downstairs. That's the minus sign. So, so far, so good. Now we have a hope that this may generalize to the relativistic situation. And what we did for the non-relative Schrodinger equation is that 
by identifying both energy and momentum as these derivative operators, we wrote down the equation of E equal P square minus 2M, but rather than just an equation between energy and momentum, this is now a differential equation between the time derivative and spatial derivatives. And that's what you have done with the non realistic quantum mechanics. And then we came up with this interpretation that Psi being a probability wave on the coordinate space. So if you look for the relativistic generalization of this, and what do you get is something called the Plan Gordon equation. So we know in the relativity, you don't have E given by P square over 2M. You first of all have the rest energy that E is MC squared. And then on top of it, you add the P squared C squared to define E squared. So this is the, the relativistic expression. We actually verified that from the Lorentz uh, transformation a couple of slides ago. So this is the equation we should use to obtain something uh, Lorentz invariant. And if I follow the same rule, what we have done for the case of the Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics, an educated guess would be this, right? Because here I have E squared, E is given by IH bar DD. So that should give you this derivative operator. And then I have P squared that's given by this derivative operator. So that gives me this gradient squared, that's Laplacian times C squared. And finally, I have M squared C to the fourth. So this would be your guess, how you might generalize non-relativistic Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics to a Lorentz invariant theory. And we introduced this differential operator box before. That's the four dimensional generalization of Laplacian, which is one over C squared dt squared minus grad squared. That's this box. In order to put that into the same unit, I have to eliminate this h bar c squared from both sides of the equation. So I multiply one over h bar squared c squared on both sides. That correctly gives me one over c squared to become part of the box, which is good. And then this m squared c to the fourth changes to m squared c squared of h bar squared. And m c of h bar has the dimension of inverse length. And that length, namely h bar over mc, is what is called the Compton wavelength. So this has the correct dimension to go together with box, which is the second order differential operator according to space-time coordinates. And this equation is called Klein-Gordon equation. And Klein and Gordon are the names of people who came up with it. It turns out though, uh, there is some private note apparently Schrodinger left was not published where he first used this equation and tried to work out the energy levels of the hydrogen atom. And it didn't work out because it turns out that this Klein-Gordon equation describes a particle with spin zero while hydrogen atom has electron in it, which has spin one half. So if you look at the fine structure of the energy of the hydrogen atom, the spin orbit coupling is one important part of it. And he got it wrong using Klein-Gordon equation. So at the end of the day, he abandoned this equation. So instead, he gave up on trying to come up with a fully relativistic equation and decided to settle with a lower standard, namely non-relativistic equation. And at the level of the non-relativistic equation, you solve for the hydrogen atom levels and you don't have fine structure. And to the level of the approximation of ignoring the fine structure, it was okay. So apparently uh, he tried this relativistic equation first, it didn't work out. So he decided to take an approximation instead. And within that approximation, he could claim victory because he dropped the fine structure uh, completely from the discussions. And I'm sure in between, uh, between this trial in his notes and his publication, he tried very hard to come up with something that would accommodate fine structure correctly, but he gave up on it, which turned out to be the right thing to do. That's how we learned the Schrodinger equation in non relativistic quantum mechanics. <laughs>
So apparently, according to this Klein-Gordon equation, it's probably not a good thing in view of that, the private notes by uh, Schrodinger. And that's a little history. And uh, I read it somewhere, so I wasn't sure it was totally a good, uh, the correct story. I looked at Wikipedia this morning, and Wikipedia said the same thing. So I hope it's the right story. You know, not everything on the internet, of course, is right, as you know. But uh, you know, I have confirmed with, uh, with multiple sources now. OK, so that's the idea of the Klein-Gordon equation. So given this idea, at this point, you might actually hope maybe we don't need to go to quantum field theory. Maybe this is actually relativistic quantum mechanics. Maybe phi allows for a, a the standard probability interpretation in the, in the sense of standard non-relativistic non quantum mechanics. So you might actually hope that. It turns out that that hope gets shattered completely. And that was one of the reasons why we had to go to quantum field theory. Namely that if you rely on the same idea you used, to derive non-relativistic Schrodinger equation and repeat the same exercise with the relativistic case, you do find a very good equation, namely Klein-Gordon equation, but this equation actually does not allow probability interpretation. And that's actually on the next slide. So it turns out that the hope that you might be able to come up with the relativistic version of quantum mechanics didn't pan out. And for a while, it wasn't clear what Klein-Gordon equation was good for. And until Heisenberg and Pauli came in and proposed this Klein-Gordon equation as a quantum field theory instead of a quantum mechanics equation, then it, all of a sudden everything made sense. So historically, the way quantum field theory started was actually based on this equation, which is fully relativistic looks great, but it didn't allow for quantum mechanical use for it. And it was abandoned once, but then Heisenberg and, and Pauli resurrected it in the context of quantum field theory. And then we still do use the equation now in the context of quantum field theory as a field equation, not the wave function. So that's the way my discussion goes uh, on the next few slides. Again, let me stop here uh, to see if there are any questions on this. Uh, how can you see from this equation that the particle has been zero? Uh, at this point, you can't tell. But one of the signs you see is that phi here doesn't have multiple components. And when you have Schrodinger equation for spin one half, for example, you need to have two components for spin one up and spin down. And so far, I don't have it. So the fact that I have an equation which is fully relativistic with only one component is a sign that this is actually spin zero. And we'll come back and com contrast that to the case of spin one and spin one half later on, where you do clearly see the multiple components of the field. So we'll come back and talk about this later, but the fact that there's only one component for a consistent equation here is a good sign that this actually represents a spin zero particle. Okay. Thank you for asking that question. Any other questions? Well, I hope at least you see that this is a fully relativistic Lorentz invariant equation. So box by itself is Lorentz invariant because you put two derivative operators together, contracted one lower index and one upper index, right? And MC of H bar is just a number. So this is invariant on the Lorentz transformation. And this is also invariant on the Lorentz transformation, basically because there are no indices. If there's no index, and that's Lorentz invariant, and that's the idea of this relativistic notation, because all the indices had already been contracted in the definition of the box. Okay, no further questions? Good. So, so why is this a problem? Uh, so we have this Klein-Gordon equation, which looks great. But the problem is that this Klein-Gordon equation with a box in it has a second order in time derivative. Remember Schrodinger equation was the first order in time derivative. Let me go back here. 
So this is the known as Schrodinger equation, which is first order in time derivative. And when you see a differential equation that's first order in time derivative, then the initial condition you're supposed to give is psi at every position in space at a given instance, and that's it. You don't need to specify its time derivative as the initial condition. Unlike in Newton's equation, which is a second order differential equation in time. So if we go MA and A is X double dot, then you have to specify two initial conditions, X itself and initial velocity, which is X dot. So if you have second order differential equation in time, which is the case with the Klein-Gordon equation, not only that you specify the initial uh, phi, but you also need to specify phi dot as an independent initial conditions. So what that means is that phi star phi does not allow you to interpret it as the probability density. Because if phi star phi is a probability density, phi star phi integrated over the entire space has to be one, you can normalize it, it needs to stay one, and that's the conservation of probability. So you need to be able to find phi star phi to be able to interpret it as a probability density only when spatial integral of the phi star phi is independent of time. And that is the case with the Schrodinger wave function. But when you take this integrator of a space and take time derivative, you find phi dot star phi plus phi star phi dot. But phi dot is something you can specify independently from phi as initial conditions. So there is no reason for that to vanish. So as a result, phi star phi cannot be interpreted as the probability density because it doesn't provide you a conserved probability. So that's why this usual probability interpretation of the Schrodinger wave function cannot be applied to Klein-Gordon equation. Then you can ask the question, okay, so if phi star phi doesn't give you a conserved probability, maybe there's something else that's conserved. And in fact, we have found a conserved current uh, 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 before, and, and maybe the Lorentz invariant generalization looks something like this. In this case, you can verify that indeed, if you take four divisions of this four current, you find zero. And you can sort of see this by your eyes on, on looking at the screen. So when you take four divisions, and when this derivative acts on the first five star, that is canceled by the second term where this four derivative acts on phi instead because of the minus sign. On the other hand, when this four derivative goes together with this, this four derivative, then lower index and upper index get contracted into a box. Box is given by negative of m squared c squared by h bar squared, which does get canceled by this four derivative contracted with four derivative over here, which then becomes a box acting on phi star Box acting on phi star, it's just complex conjugate of this, is given by phi star with m squared c squared h bar squared. So this also turns into m squared c squared h bar squared with a relative minus sign, so they cancel. So you do find, indeed, that this four vector j mu is conserved. And if you actually divide this up into time component and spatial components, then time component of time derivative is given by the divisions of the spatial component. So that does give you the, the continuity equation. So this is a Lorentz, uh, 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 the relativistic notation of the continuity equation we talked about before. So you do get something conserved, namely that taking the time component of this Lorentz four vector and do the integral over the entire space that gives you a quantity, which is Lorentz invariant, and it's conserved. 
So that's good. You do find something that's conserved. However, because of this minus sign here, time component of this is not positive definite. And for the probability interpretation, probability has to be zero or positive, positive semi-definite. It can't be negative, but this J naught, time component of J mu can be negative. So it doesn't allow for a probability interpretation. Namely, you can satisfy two requirements at the same time. For the probability interpretation of the wave function, you need to be able to define a probability which is positive semi-definite and is conserved. You need both of them, positive semi-definite and conserved. And first one try this, we did, phi star phi is clearly positive semi-definite, but it's not conserved. Time component of the four vector is conserved, but it's not positive semi-definite. So I cannot satisfy both of them together. So the Klein-Golden equation is a good equation in the sense that it's fully Lorentz invariant and we would like to make use of that, but we cannot use this equation as a relativistic generalization of the Schrodinger equation because it doesn't allow us a probability interpretation that phi is a wave function. Phi is not a wave function, something else. It's a good equation, but this is not a Schrodinger equation in the usual sense. Phi is a field instead of the wave function. So that's the realization made by Heisenberg and Pauli. So if you want to use this as a relativistic generalization of the Schrodinger theory, it didn't work. So it's a good thing that Schrodinger backed down to become less ambitious and deal with the non-relativistic theory first. Otherwise he wouldn't have thought of the Schrodinger equation. Maybe we are still struggling with how to understand quantum mechanics today without the genius of Erwin Schrodinger. Thanks, thankfully, he did back down. He became a little bit less ambitious and, and decided to settle on non relativistic approximation of it. And that's how he discovered a wave function, which satisfies the Schrodinger equation. But what we learn now today is that if you want to make it relativistic, then there's no simple equation that gives you a wave function. Instead, we discovered a wave equation, which is an equation for a field, which you wanna put into the Lagrangian and quantize it and to see what comes out of it instead. So we now abandon this idea of the hope to make quantum mechanics relativistic. That turned out to be impossible but we do have a good field equation, which is relativistic. So we make use of this good field equation, namely Klein-Gordon equation, put that into the Lagrangian and quantize that Lagrangian as a quantum field theory. And hopefully that will give us something useful. Then it turns out it does give us something useful, namely the quantum field theory of spin zero particle. So that's how the rest of the discussion goes. So let me stop here again to see if there are any questions on this. So now we are making the jump again, just like what we did at the very beginning of this course. Uh, I guess one conceptual question I had was, mm -hmm. we, we can define a Lagrangian for this field and mm -hmm. the solution of this Lagrangian, essentially a wave equation um, or the Euler Lagrange equation um, and that defines like the classical limit in this um, quantum field theory. That's but right. When we quantize it, mm -hmm. we don't really utilize those solutions necessarily, right? We, we simply just apply it to the vacuum state to produce, you know, various number of particles. Um, so I, I guess I'll just... Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll just confuse what the relevance mm -hmm. of the Lagrangian is right. if we decide to quantize it and how do we actually use it? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. So, so if you remember the case of the harmonic oscillator, in quantum mechanics, we always use the Schrodinger equation and the operator is a time dependent. 
that's a Schrodinger picture, right? But if you go to Heisenberg picture, then the X and P operators do satisfy Heisenberg equation motion, which is basically this kind of equation for the harmonic oscillator where phi is X. X double dot plus omega squared X is zero. That's the equation motion of the, Heisen the, uh, the position operator in the Heisenberg picture. And you can use the equation motion in the Heisenberg picture and that's what Heisenberg did. That's why the Heisenberg picture, assuming that X is now a matrix instead of a number, and that's the jump he made and came up with what he called the matrix mechanics before the invention of the Schrodinger equation. So you can actually stick to that picture as well where operators satisfy the equations of motion. It turns out that in relativistic quantum field theory, that's the way we formulate things because you would like to treat time and space on equal footing. And this is an equation where time and space are put on equal footing. And that's good if phi is a Heisenberg operator, which depends on time. But if you want to stick to Schrodinger picture, the phi is an operator that doesn't depend on time. So it does not satisfy this field equation and then you completely write Sahil, then this kind of field equation looks like that's kind of useless. So what we do instead is once we want to do everything in a manifestly Lorentz invariant fashion, we switch to Heisenberg picture. Well, we also use the interaction picture in the context of perturbation theory. And both in Heisenberg picture and interaction picture, phi operator satisfies the equation like this. So solving this equation actually does makes sense for us. It does tell us useful information and we will build the Hilbert space using this Heisenberg picture operators instead. So it turns out that this field equation is useful uh, when you uh, deal with these things in a manifestly low end uh, relativistic fashion. Oh, I see, yeah, that, that makes a lot more sense. So okay. in the case that we, in, in the previous case, we stuck to the Schrodinger equation, mm -hmm. um, but then we would, uh, derive the Hamiltonian from the Lagrangian and then apply it to these quantum states defined with these field operators, mm -hmm. right? And so right. that would be the Schrodinger picture that we've done in the past. But right. this field equation has utility if we decide to use the Heisenberg picture where these field operators are now time dependent. That's right. Okay. Thank you for the great summary. Any other questions here? So that. Do you find it convincing that the probability interpretation fails for the Klein-Gordon equation? Is everybody convinced? It's a kind of conceptual issue here. And if you have the following question, well, could there be a fully relativistic equation which is first order time derivative? If you had that question 70 years ago, then you could have discovered Dirac equation. And we will come back and talk about that later. So it turns out that Dirac was aware of this problem that people fail to come up with the relativistic wave function. So he asked the question, could there be a relativistic version which sticks with the first order and time derivative? And if that's true, equation has to be also first order and spatial derivative because you have to treat them on equal footing to be consistent with the relativity. And he did come up with that kind of equation. And that is what is called the Dirac equation. And we will talk about that later. It turns out though, that Dirac equation had a different kind of problem, namely that it had a solution with negative energy. So he had to do something about it. That's a whole different set of stories we we'll come back to later on. So keep that in your mind. So this Klein-Gordon equation failed Maybe something else still works. And that's something you can try, but it in the end failed for a different reason. So the Dirac equation again had to be regarded at the end of the day as a field equation instead. And we go to quantum field theory. And that gives you spin one half particle instead of spin zero. So either way, there are different reasons why these relativistic equations fail, but no matter what the reasons are, we could not come up with the relativistic quantum mechanics, but instead we had to go to 
relativistic quantum field theory. And that's the story I mentioned at the very beginning of the course back in August, that to be able to come up with the relativistic theory, you don't have a choice. You have to go to quantum field theory. And this is the reason. So in the case of spin zero particle, you have a, a, a very good relativistic field equation, but it could not be interpreted as the equation for the wave function because the probability interpretation fails. Instead, we go to the field equation to be incorporated into the quantum field theory. We quantize the field to find a relativistic theory, relativistic quantum theory of relativistic spin zero particle. So that's what we're going to do next. So the first thing is, as Sahil said, we now have a field equation. So we need to find the correct Lagrangian for the field that would reproduce this field equation as its Euler Lagrange equation. So that's what we do here. So Klein Gordon equation cannot be, oh, I, I'm actually summarizing the discussion so far. So the Klein Gordon equation cannot be regarded as a relativistic Schrodinger equation because it doesn't allow for uh, uh, the probability interpretation. So instead, we regard it as an Euler Lagrange equation of a field. So the question is, what is the Lagrangian for it? So that's why we start a lot writing down on the next slide. Okay, so if there are any conceptual questions at this stage, this is a good moment to ask. All right, there doesn't seem to be any questions. So let me jump right in. So we want to find the Lagrangian whose Euler Lagrange equation is the Klein Gordon equation. And once you have a Lagrangian, we need to find a way of quantizing it. So here we go. This is the Lagrangian. So we have this familiar combination of m squared c squared h bar squared. And then I have this derivative acting on phi. And again, when the derivative operator has lower index, that is the usual derivative. When the derivative operator has an upper index, you have to revert the signs of the spatial components. But in any case, I'm contracting a lower index and upper index. So this combination is Lorentz invariant. And Lagrangian is meant to be integrated over time to define the action. So that's this action. Now have three spatial integral to define the Lagrangian from the Lagrangian density. And the whole Lagrangian is now integrated over time to define the action. And when you look at the action, what you find is that Lagrangian density is already Lorentz invariant. There are no indices left. Here indices are contracted. Here there are no indices to begin with. So everything inside the square bracket is Lorentz invariant. And this Lorentz invariant Lagrangian density is integrated over the entire space time. So this four dimensional integral is also invariant under the Lorentz transformation. So the action is now manifestly Lorentz invariant. But from this action, it's very easy to derive Euler Lagrange equation. You take a small variation of phi star here and there. And when you take variation with respect to phi star, the delta phi star, you'd rather want to have this derivative acting on the rest. So you do integration by part to let this derivative act on phi instead. And then you have del mu upstairs times del mu downstairs. So that becomes the box. But because you have done the integration by parts, there's a minus sign. So what comes out of it is that overall delta phi squared times negative box phi minus m squared c squared h bar squared phi. So that gives you the Euler Lagrange equation, which is precisely the Klein Gordon equation. So it all makes sense. Action is manifestly Lorentz invariant. And you wrote down the Euler-Lagrange equation out of this Lorentz invariant action. 
and out comes out the field equation, which is also manifestly Lorentz invariant. So that makes a very good sense. So the rest of the question is that, okay, this does seem to be the right Lagrangian to start with. So let's see how we can quantize it and build a Hilbert space for that. So that's the next stage. But it turns out that there's nothing new here. All you would do is basically exactly the same thing as you would do with the harmonic oscillator in quantum mechanics. You identify the canonical momentum, you set up the canonical commutation relation, and then you find the Hilbert space where the canonical commutation relation works. And that's exactly what we have done, done also for the Schrodinger field. We have done the same thing also for Maxwell's field. So now we are applying the same idea to this Klein-Gordon field. So the process is nothing new. The only thing that's new is that we are now staring at the Lagrangian in, in action, which is manifestly Lorentz invariant. But the process itself for the quantization is exactly the same thing we have been doing over and over again. So I hope that would give you some comfort that not everything is new here. The only thing new here is the Lagrangian that's new, which is now clearly Lorentz invariant. Everything else is basically the same thing as we are already familiar with from past examples of the Schrodinger field and Maxwell field. Okay, again, once I, uh, here I stop and see if there are any questions on that. You're pretty quiet today. Are people tired? I'm tired. <laughs> you know, all these Zoom meetings and everything. So like Mark Dr. Gibson, definitely Zoom fatigue. But anyway, okay. Is it Elijah? No? Okay. So let's quantize it. And so what you're supposed to do is very clear. First, I just rewrote this relativistic notation explicitly with a time derivative and spatial derivative. So time derivative is a zeroth component of the four vector. So that's a time derivative times one over C to make sure that everything has the same dimension. So as a result, the time component of this del mu phi star del mu phi is one over C twice phi star dot phi dot. Spatial component of the derivatives this lower component derivative gives you the right derivative, but upper component of the derivative has a minus sign to it. So hence I get this negative grad phi dot grad phi. So these two pieces are inside this first term in a relativistic notation. And for the second term, there's nothing special to be written out. I just wrote out the same thing. But now I wrote it this way, I can take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to phi dot to identify canonically conjugate momentum, which is one over C squared phi dot star. So there we go. This is the way you set up the canonical commutation relation. Phi of X is the field variable one over C squared phi star dot is its canonically conjugate momentum. So XP is IH bar, but of course it's a field theory. So the field is local. It comes with the delta function in possession space. So that's basically it. We now have the canonical commutation relation among the fields. And if this is true, then you, the other thing is true you can define the canonical conjugate momentum to phi star instead. So I have commutator of phi star here and conjugate momentum is one over C square phi dot. So I put one over C square phi dot here and that is also IH bar delta function. I did not write it because I can take the Hermitian conjugate of the whole thing and get the same answer. So they are not independent in a way so I did not write it, but you could have done that as well. So now that I have this commutation relation between phi and phi dot, 
also phi phi, phi star, phi star, they have to commute with each other. And then I can write out the expansion of the field operator using creation narration operator. So this phi right now is a complex field. It's not real or permission. So when you expand this in Fourier series, I get separate coefficients for e to the ipx and e to the minus ipx. So that's how I introduce a and b operators. And phi dot is also given by a and b operators, but with a negative sign and minus i on top of it. And also this ep goes from downstairs to upstairs. And ep is the energy of the particle with momentum p, which is the square root of p squared c to squared plus m squared c to the fourth. So this is just shorthand notation of the energy of the particle with momentum p. So once you have this Fourier series expansion, you can verify that this canonical moment, uh, the commutation relation is actually satisfied. So this is then the canonical commutation relation among the creation and addition operators for A, but another set of creation and addition operators for B. So this field ends up having two sets of creation and addition operators. And that's the way this field phi is expanded in momentum modes. And here again, I use the box normalization in a square box of the site L. And the rest is given by H bar and C to satisfy the correct normalization everywhere. But anyway, so that's the way you do the mode expansion. And you can verify that indeed they satisfy the canonical commutation relations. And I'm planning to actually make this the next homework problem. Okay, uh, any questions at this stage? Uh, yes, I have two questions. The first is that I think you made a mistake and at the last equality of the Lagrange because you missed a star. It should be a like graph five ah, star. That's star right, yeah, there should be star yeah. here. Okay. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Okay. Uh, yeah, and another one is that I don't really see why we need like two terms when expanding the field operator out. And it also happens in the Maxwell field, right? But yeah. when we are expanding the Schrodinger field, we only have the first the first piece like a e to the i p dot x over mm -hmm. h bar. So yeah, the essential really difference comes from the fact that, uh, that we now have the second order in time derivative, unlike only first order in time derivative of the Schrodinger field. And being the second order, phi and phi dot are independent initial conditions you can specify at the time slice t. So I have to make sure that phi and phi dot are independent. So I need basically in, independent degrees of freedom for phi and phi dot. But because in the end, what I want is everything expressed in terms of creation narration operators. I basically traded two independent degrees of freedom phi and phi dot by A and B dagger. So both phi and phi dot are now written in terms of A and B dagger, but with the opposite linear combinations. Here is A plus B dagger, here A minus B dagger. So I'm trading independent phi and phi dot by two independent A and B dagger. So that's the idea. In the case of Schrodinger field, I didn't have another independent initial condition of psi dot. So all I needed was psi itself. So I just had to do the Fourier expansion of psi dot in terms of A. That's why I didn't need the second term. So going from the first order differential equation in time to second order differential equation in time, not only that order changes, but degrees of freedom also changes because you have yet another independent initial condition you have to specify. And that is now manifested in this independent A and B dagger. But hopefully this actually makes better sense. We actually come back to discuss what happens if this Klein-Gordon field is not complex, but real. In that case, phi has to be real, which is yet additional constraint you impose. Then you are forced to identify this B dagger 
with a dagger to make sure that the whole thing is remission. Then, even though we now have a independent initial condition from phi dot, you still have uh, to reduce the degree of freedom down to a half of what we have over here. So that ends up identifying A and B. So we'll come back and talk about this later. So hopefully it makes better sense after you see that step. But at this point, I hope the message is clear because you have independent initial condition you can specify for phi as well as phi dot. You do need two independent degrees of freedom in the Fourier expansion as well. So I'm trading two independent initial conditions by two independent harmonic oscillators, A and B dagger, hence two sets of the creation addition operators. Does that answer your question, Ray? Uh, yes. And okay. so, yeah, yeah. So we should expect that in the Dirac equation that we will only have one set of creation annihilation operator, right? Because it, it has only one time derivative in psi. Um, right? So it is true that you don't specify Dirac field and its time derivative independently. It does, it does turn out though, that you still have to introduce two set of oscillators and you'll see that. So uh, I, I don't go any further at this point. And that's an excellent question, but you do see two sets of uh, harmonic oscillators in the end. And that has to do with the fact that in the Dirac equation, you find positive energy solutions and negative energy solutions because it has four components uh, of the Dirac equation. So here I have only one component phi, but have a second order differential equation. So I basically have phi and phi dot as two independent degrees of freedom. For the Dirac equation, now it's first order uh, time derivative. So I have only psi as the initial condition, but psi comes in four components. So it turns out that there are four harmonic oscillators I have to specify. So that's a different reason why you have multiple harmonic oscillators. Here, it's due to the fact that this is a second order differential equation. For the case of Dirac equation, it's first order, but psi comes with the four components. So that's why you have multiple harmonic oscillators, a different reason for multiple harmonic oscillators. But you come back and see it. Thanks for asking that questions. Any other questions at this stage? Okay, all right. So now that we have two sets of the harmonic oscillators, creation and addition operators, we'd like to understand what they represent. So using the same mode expansion we just talked about, first thing to check is the Hamiltonian. And Hamiltonian is pi q dot minus Lagrangian. Pi q dot actually turns this Lagrangian to this one here because P is this for phi. So P of phi times phi dot is this, but I can also take phi star to be Q and the rest is P. So P of phi star times phi star dot is yet another factor of this. So I have this twice, then minus Lagrangian that subtracts one power of the first term so I end up with the one power of the first term. So the reason I have one power of uh, uh, one times the first term is because it's one plus one minus one. And that's how we ended up with this first term. And the rest doesn't involve time derivative. So it's just the, the opposite sign of the Lagrangian. So that's how you get this Hamiltonian over here. And then you stick in this mode expansion into this Hamiltonian and perform the spatial integral. And end result is very simple. That's the same calculation you have done with the homework problem on E squared plus B squared for the Maxwell field. And you find energy times A dagger A. But there's also B dagger B in this case. So what you find here is that for a given momentum, A and B creates different sets of particles, but they share, they share the same energy 
for a given momentum, which means they have the same mass. So both energies are given by EP, which is square root of P squared C squared plus M squared C to the fourth. So the fact that both of them are given by the same EP means A and B creation operators create two different degrees of freedom, but they have the same mass, which is not surprising because the mass comes from this term in the Lagrangian. So single Lagrangian has only single parameter M and from this single Lagrangian came out A and B. So it's not a surprise that they end up having the same mass. But now we have to think a little bit to understand then what is the distinction between A and B? Both A and B came out from our try to quantize this Lagrangian that re reproduces the Klein-Gordon field. But just because the how much degrees of freedom there are as the initial condition for the field, we were forced to introduce two sets of harmonic oscillators, A and B. And A and B are now interpreted as the creation operator of different sets of particles, but those different particles have the same mass. So what is it? What is the distinction between A and B? So that's the question we have to address on the next slide. But anyway, so any questions about this step? So if you have already done the homework problem, you know that just sticking in expression of the mode expansion would allow you to work out the Hamiltonian written in terms of A dagger A number operators. And for each number operator of the momentum P, you find the energy EP. So in the homework problem, this EP was written as H bar times omega P, if you remember. So it's the same idea. So you have a Hamiltonian given by the collection of the harmonic oscillators. Each harmonic oscillator has a definite P. And when you create a particle of the momentum P that costs you energy given by EP, so this now allows for the standard interpretation of the creation relation operators uh, where Hamiltonian is simply given by the number operator for each momentum mode. And you read off the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian just by focusing on this coefficient because A dagger A is always an integer. So depending on how many particles you put into the momentum mode P, this is just a number, one, two, three, four, and for each number that costs you a, a energy EP, which is P squared C squared plus M squared C to the fourth square root. So that now defines a relativistic Fox space. We have built the Fox space, starting with the vacuum state. You can successively add particles on top of the, the vacuum state. And each time you add a new particle that costs you energy EP, and we now have EP given by this relativistic expression of p squared c squared plus m squared c to the fourth square root. So now we have a relativistic Hilbert space. So that's how we managed to actually construct a relativistic quantum field theory now. But the remaining question is so what the difference is between A and B. Okay, let me stop here again, see if there are any questions. Oh, uh, I just, I think we're, um a bit over the end of lecture. Oops, I'm sorry. I wasn't paying attention. I, I really apologize. Okay, let me, <laughs> let me finish here. And then we start from the earlier slides next week. Okay, <laughs> thank you for pointing that out, Anna. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you could have spoken up earlier. <laughs> anyway, are there any questions? Uh, I just had a very quick question on the phi. Uh, so last okay. time when we quantized um, psi, we got that as directly as our annihilation creation operators. Uh -huh. But this time we performed a mode expansion to get um, the creation annihilation operator. So I guess That's I was right. just wondering why is there this particular distinction between like directly making it a creation operator and then having this mode expansion and making it a creation operator? Yeah, actually you have seen something similar when we quantize the electromagnetic field. Vector potential was written as A plus A, a dagger in that case. And the reason why you also have A dagger in there is because vector potential was real. So you have to make sure that it's Hermitian. So when you have an A in it, you also have to have A dagger in it. 
And phi is now complex, but it sort of inherits the same idea that it has both annihilation and creation operator in it. And when you actually go back to real Klein-Gordon field instead of complex Klein-Gordon field, then you have actually A and A dagger instead of a separate B dagger. So you will see the situation which is much more similar to the vector potential. So the main difference between the Schrodinger field and the Klein-Gordon or Maxwell field is that it's second order and it can be real. So these two differences make the mode expansion different. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, sorry that I went over time. So I will go back a couple of slides uh, next week, just in case that some people actually left early and make sure that, uh, the, that nobody would miss anything. So maybe I start somewhere around here. Okay, sorry about that. Have a good weekend. Um, thanks. You too, see you, thank you.